Welcome back to All That Jam, where music has no limits. I am Kevin. I am joined today by Jonathan Freelich. He is a talented musician out of New Orleans and known mostly, I guess, most famously for the Klez New Orleans Klezmer All-Stars. But he is also a podcaster, a composer, an arranger, a filmmaker, and a teacher, which is always a great thing to see. How are we doing today, Jonathan? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Very nice, very nice. So why why don't we uh just go back with the origin story, um, how you discovered the guitar, how you ended up with the klezmer? Uh sure. Well, I started playing guitar when I was a uh early teenager. Uh, I'd played cello before that somewhat since I was about nine, but uh, you know, guitar was the thing and uh socially and uh that you know it was sort of interesting that that worked. And then I'd also switched from listening to classical music to things like uh well, I was mostly blown away by Jimi Hendrix records and Bob Dylan records, I think, early on and thought I'd do that. And then I got a Lead Belly record and that just switched everything around, the Lead Belly and Muddy Waters. And the, uh, just my first, yeah, my first foray in a record store was Lead Belly, John Coltrane and Muddy Waters. And uh, and I'd sort of, uh, I'd sort of flipped me out from there. And then I, uh, that was living in England at that time. And then I, I moved to live with my mother in California, which was, uh, a whole other thing because a lot of this music was still alive here uh in in a certain way and i had uh, a couple of really good teachers out there moved to santa cruz I mean, that's where i met my friend ben elman who's in galactic and the klezmer all-stars okay. and uh we traveled to new orleans together after he was doing a radio show in santa cruz after i moved to santa cruz to play in a band uh, uh but that didn't pan out so i was just there hanging around and uh thinking about music and so we both moved to new orleans and that wasn't what started the Klezmer band at that time. He we moved here. He started playing with uh, the Little Rascals Brass Band, which was just starting at that time. And I was uh, I was playing with in the Kermit Ruffins in Kermit Ruffins' first band, uh, the Kermit Ruffins Jam Session, as it was called then. And um, and myself and the bass player, there was a clarinetist here. Uh, I I'd, I'd been in New Orleans a while, then I left, and I came back on a pretext that I was going to go to school, which I didn't spend much time doing because I had all these gigs pretty quickly, and um, uh, and I was suddenly playing with Kermit and a, a big uptown band called the uh, Mike Ward and the Reward, and then basically, um, uh, so the, the, basically the way that that developed is we started getting together with the, the clarinetist named Ben Shank, uh, and we had a thing called Ben and the Boys. We did a bigger repertoire than he's he's very much um uh he's still got a thing called the panorama jazz band he's not in the klezmer all-stars anymore but we started at that point and there were we had three klezmer tunes and everyone was more excited by those and so we started doing that and then people a few people started coming by that wanted to play with us one was my old friend ben glenn so anyway we, uh, shortly after that we formed the klezmer all-stars so that was uh really a long time ago in 1992 or something like that i think and uh that's the origin of the klezmer all-stars i guess in a way it sort of merged it sort of really came out of uh, the kermit ruffin's jam session right <laughs> it, so yeah over 30 years you're hitting 32 years there huh yeah 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 that's right yeah it's really I, yeah that was when the band became that we were doing the klezmer band klezmer thing since 91 i think yeah so 32 33 years something like that yeah right. So, so how did you come to a, uh, a, a Eastern European secular dance music, for lack of a better term, to uh, to in New Orleans? Well, you know, we hadn't. I, I suppose the way that that works is we weren't all coming from the same background. Uh, uh, you know, my grand my grandparents' house. I mean, they were very. I'd heard Yiddish music a lot. Uh, you know, my father's parents and and uh, when I was growing up, but, but I didn't really think of it as something I was going to do, although I, you know, I like the songs and everything, uh, I like the style, but when I got here, I think for all of us, I mean, in that, in those days, there really weren't that many available klezmer records that were that easy to come across. I do notice that all of us pretty much it's the, the, the streets of gold record that, that our crumb had done the cover for had gotten out. There was a certain brass band feel to that and a sort of element like that. And I think the the incredible, incredibly intoxicating experience of, be, of, of you know, a brass and second line culture in New Orleans may start you mm -hmm. thinking, wow, wouldn't it be cool if you had the, this kind of band coming down the street, if you had this kind of band coming down the street? And I think at the beginning, we were like, hey, well, it's, you know, 
wouldn't it be funny if we had a second line Klezer band, you know, and, and these kinds of ideas. And, uh, and, uh, I think we got together sort of on that thing, but the, you end up, uh, the, you know, the music, uh, one of the things about new Orleans in those days, everyone danced, right. This is before phones and the internet, which was sort of, you know, it's hard to tell whether that's con destroyed everything or not, but I, I think so. <laughs> but, uh, that's just a side, that's a side politic. We'll get to that in a minute, but, uh, or maybe not get to it at all. But, the, <laughs> but, but, uh, but in the, in those days, you know, shows were the internet. So we would play packed shows all, all the time with people dancing and in New Orleans, uh, shows started late and went on a long time. You were expect, you know, you had to be able to entertain people and keep them dancing for three to four hours, uh, in the middle of the night in the middle of the week. And, uh, and, uh, it was a very exciting time. And uh, what really happened is that then it, it hit a whole other level because, um, the drummer that we were working with first vacated the band and I was playing in a band with me and Willie, well, I was playing, basically I was in a band with the rhythm section from the Neville brothers. The Neville brothers were really, that was when they were really big. I mean, they were global stars at that point. And, uh, and, uh, and Willie, the drummer, was like, I'll play with the Klezmer band. So we thought, yeah, no, you probably don't want to do that. And it, it turned out he did it and he loved it. He immediately made stickers, t-shirts and wanted to do everything with us. And we ended up, that's really how we sort of got out there because Willie was, at that time, the Neville brothers were stars. That really, they were the biggest thing out of New Orleans. And and uh, so, uh, uh, and of course, you know, now it seems like so long ago, but, but uh but that was um, so pretty much that's how that's how that started. It's because of the sort of necessities of, of keeping people dancing in New Orleans. And there's a certain energy with right. that that really structured the way the band is. It was less of a it was more symbiotic the way that that right. happened with audiences and us. Yeah. Right. And I uh, just I discovered you guys from seeing Glenn and Mean Willie Green play with Monkey Ranch at jazz oh, yeah. fest maybe 96 or 97 and uh right. i was like this is the greatest thing ever and so i dug in someone's like oh the guy's name's glenn hartman so i dug into it i ended up in uh your guys camp there uh, yeah yeah well we were all playing in so many bands part part of what goes on with the energy of the new orleans Cosmo all stars over time of course we've had some shifts in, in personnel i mean but you know everybody played with a lot of projects as you do down here and i think probably it it was very quickly i mean we weren't people that rejected we were just trying to create energy for the audience that was there not really trying to make some sort of you know uh you know hybridized or pure uh you know make statements about yiddish music we like the songs they resonated with a certain kind of rhythmic thing down here there's a certain relationship with with with, with vulgar rhythm and 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 the trucio rhythm that's that's everywhere here and we were really just not, we weren't rejecting any, people were coming in off everything from reggae gigs to jazz gigs or to, to you know, the funk gigs around town. And everyone would just, you know, was playing so much that you would just sort of play these songs in whatever sort of vernacular you were, you were running with mm -hmm. uh, without much thinking about it because we had to deliver long nights of music. And I think that, you know, as I said, there's a, there's this, there's an element where it it really has it, it's really related to the fact that everyone uh, here plays so many uh, styles of music. I'm I'm avoiding using mm -hmm. the unbearable uh, thing that everybody does, which is call it a gumbo. But uh, but right. there you go. <laughs> How about a uh, a fondue? <laughs> we we'll call it fondue. There you go. <laughs> um, do do you feel? I, I guess the little I know about klezmer music and the traditions it comes from, there's some improvisational element to it, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a very, very improvisational element to it. Uh, I think, um, you know, that's a funny term. I mean, I, I don't know. Everyone, everyone, everyone what, what do people mean when they say improvisation? It means, it means so many different things. But I think one of the things that we can say is it's not a classical style. It's very much a vernacular style. So I think, right. I think really, I mean, I think these days when people say what improvisation, what they mean is it's not one of the, it's not out of one of the major uh, classical forms in the world, like, uh, you know, Indian classical music or which has a lot of improvisation or Japanese court music or, or Western classical music or, or any of those sorts of things. It's definitely a vernacular music of, streets and functions and for the for, for 
running life cycle events. It's related to Eastern European stuff. And it's a transcendental music. It requires energy. I think almost anything that requires transcending the energy you walked in with and creating extra energy mm -hmm. means that it involves improvisation that way. And, right. and, 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 and of course, go ahead. I was going to say, and that intersects with Lake Dixieland and some of the musical tra traditions out of New Orleans. So if you think about it, it kind of does go hand in hand. Yes, it does. It very much does. And, and uh, of course, you know, there had been crossover uh, several generations ago already. And you can see this in some, some of the jazz repertoire, some of what the jazz, the writers that, uh, the songwriters that ended up uh, uh, right, composing some of the songs that became what is in the standards jazz repertoire over over early on, where people that were had influence from from that music, and also the amount that jazz was impacted it early on because they people were coming from Eastern Europe thought jazz is very exciting, and uh, mm -hmm. so there's a there was a period of like oh no they got to have you know. Uh, saxophones and and right. stuff like this in the music and so that was you know there was a period where it, it, it would it had already done that early on there was there had been some movement that way and yeah sure they're related they both had to do with excited stuff and i think in terms of american uh i don't know what you call it folk concepts i'm not sure folk music is really a thing after recording but um but it it, it I hope I'm not being too academic, but I just think that no, that, not at all. No, I love this. This is <laughs> this is what no, I love. Just, for. <laughs> I, 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 but I think that you know, in in that period, which is so different than our period, when when there was clearly, you know, ends of America unknown to itself that were discovering itself with that had with everything with the music and the songs of very, very, very of people, uh, of very different sort of groups of pockets of people in the United States. This was one of those situations. And, and in the in the period of its self-discovery mm -hmm. uh, that happened in the earlier part of the, you know, in the, the, the earlier part of the 20th century, um, it was uh, one of these things where the, you know, these, you know, people were excited upon discovering new sounds out of each other, you know, and coming in contact with each other's cultures rubbing up against each other, uh, which was very fertile, I think, in, in that period before the Second World War. Yeah. No. So how do you approach um, respecting the tradition of the klezmer music while also having Jonathan, you know, your voice there, but also adding these other traditions on top of it, it making your fondue? <laughs> yeah, I, I, in, a, in a way, I consider that kind of argument a little bit antiquated. When we started out, everybody was very concerned. Uh, in general, culturally, uh, you know, when we started out, you know, very, very much around the 80s and 90s, everyone was concerned about what is authentic. And really, it was left over. That's why I was dreading using the term folk music, because in a sense, they're sort of, you know, 19th century, vaguely racist concepts based around, you know, around who is a, you know, untainted, you know, the noble savage type type discussion. Right. So. But nonetheless, this had sort of permeated its way into back into the culture in the in the '90s, and certainly everyone was sitting around discussing what's traditional and what's not. And uh, my philosophy on that was always I always sort of thumb my nose at it because uh, I sort of um, felt that you are what you are, and what will come out of you will come out of you. And that's the reality of the situation. I like the songs and I look at the forms. I mean, I'm a composer and, and I very much was always uh, looking, looking at the songs. You know, I mean, it's interesting music. It uses these interesting scales. People are playing interesting stuff. I was interested as a music. I mean, it worked my mind. And also the transcendental factor. I mean, I was into any kind of thing that had to do with, you know, mind expansion and, and, and that kind of thing. So there's, there's an element that, 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 that goes there. So I think the way that I looked at it was, well, these songs came from somewhere, were written somehow, so I can write them and express things that I want to express using the ideas that are there. And of course, music always has whatever comes in from people. Now, I know that there's an argument. Some people are very concerned about what is authentically a thing, in which case they're, very, they're a little bit more uh, worried about those things as though there is a certain um, built up stylistic reality this this defines it 
as though music is ossified ever in time. And I know certain people believe that. Uh, I do not believe it, and I can prove it on an extra sketch regardless. But I think people are trying to, I think people generally are trying to, uh, when they do that, they're more afraid. These are identity issues. I mean, it is really peculiar stuff. I mean, you know, this is why I don't subscribe to it so much because I think it's, it, 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 even if it was just a, a Jewish thing and it, it, relates, it relates to that, I would put it this way, that if it is, then we have to include all of the ideas of Jews. Right. That includes everything with Freud, Arnold Schoenberg, uh, you know, Maimonides, everybody gets in the mix of pleasure. It, right. Either it's all of that, or or you're talking about some kind of purification ritual, right. which honestly, most folk music projects, I mean, even, you know, when they talk about Bartok, I mean, Bartok was trying to purify, you know, get rid of the Magyar influence in Hungarian music. This is why he got, in, he got into that. So folklore, I find it a little bit problematic. So I stay away from it. I figure uh, whatever I do is what I do. I happen to love that music. You people can be like, he's not real or he's real. It doesn't really matter. You make you make the music and you make it exciting for people. Don't be boring. This is the way I look at music. <laughs> there you go. Well, but okay. So do you feel like you're preserving the Klezmer musical on any level then with by playing it and recording and putting out a new album? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that happens anyway, but I feel like the, 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 for all of humanity, I mean, everyone's got contributions uh, for all of humanity and what is useful to people in terms mm -hmm. what, of whatever is useful to people will stay will stay in the world. What What is no longer useful will disappear. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's it, my responsibility is to contribute, to, you know, my piece of the contribution is I put in, these are, these are my interests, it's what I think is exciting, these are the stories that have come out, these are my... This is this is my urges to play with it this way, and the band's urges, and to include things in the band. If it's use, whatever's useful will stay there. Whatever won't. I mean, in my in my world, all of those Yiddish songs have turned out to be useful, right? So I guess they do get I guess they do get carried on for another. You know, in other words, they get they do yeah. get carried on for another generation because they are right. useful. But it's not really. I'm not. I can't say I'm the person that's really. For a lot of people, they'd say, "Oh no, that's not real. That's not the ideas we want." You know, and they move right. along and. So there's a certain kind of evolutionary process with it, you know, but yep. I, I think I think we're, you know, it's again, because, you know, we do a lot of things that are that, that some people would say, oh, but it has the hallmarks of this New Orleans thing. It's not really like the other Klezmer bands. And so in that case, what that means is either you think New Orleans music is cool and useful and great or you don't. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <definitely. laughs> you see what I mean? That's I that's it. that's the way that works, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, over the long period, over over long periods of time, we talk about preserving something because I don't know right. about preserving things. A lot of time, I think the problem with preservation with a lot of people actually what they mean is uh, there's a danger of inbreeding, which has right. poor, poor genetic f formation at a certain point. Right. That's actually the inauthentic act is not being yourself and attempting to be somebody other than what you are, you know. Right. Right. But you, you, you go back and like, you're talking about lead belly and all that you are continuing that because I guess you've absorbed it on some level, you know? Yeah. Not that but you... I, I mean, that's true. You know, I mean, it, like I said, working with a lot of different musicians. I mean, one of the other things I'm doing now is work with the washboard jazz blue trio where I get to play right. in those right. styles that I love from then, right. from when I was younger, like all the great, right. uh, yeah. the great, uh, you know, blues and ragtime, medicine show, but all the, that whole world of, of people that where there's a, 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 just an incredible bunch of guitar styles and guitar approaches out there. And I never really was like, oh, I'm going to do this until somebody, this was their expression. They said, I know you do that. Can you come, can you come get this together with me? So I, in the Washboard Jazz Blues Trio. And so it's not, it's not like I feel like I have, in other words, that's something that happens. And, and uh, yeah, those are great kinds of music. But honestly, our way of looking at something like Lead Belly, who's a guy who knew, uh, you know, those traditions, which are very informative to me, are people that had to play songs from people all over America. And all the songs, he, he talks about it. And, you know, he knew all the ways to play Bull Weevil because it was different in different states and different groups of people. So... So when, you, when you're when you looking at it that way, an actual songster like that, it's not like he's in a preservationist state. Obviously, he's in a very sophisticated right. state. Right, exactly. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Fantastic. I love that. 
Thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go back to 1994, or was it 95 that the first LP came out for the Klezmers? Our first record, I think, was 94, So I think, maybe, 93, 94. I don't know. Maybe you probably know better than me. I can't, can't yeah. remember the exact date. But well, yeah, I, I, found two, I, I found two things. It said 94 on Sketchy Records, and then it said yeah, 95 on Girt Town. Okay, so it's 94. Sketchy was where it came out first. It came out on a cassette tape, and okay. uh, we were, were stre stretchy, stretchy records. So yeah, that was the first record sketchy in '94. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Stretchy, sketchy is funny. Yeah, it was stretchy, and uh, yeah, the first record. And we in those days we put a, stuff out on cassette. How funny! Um, and um, yeah, the first record was on Stretchy '94, and then uh, and then after that we got signed to uh, Shanaki Records. Uh, you know, the old days of the record the, uh, when there was a real record business, and you right. get a recording contract being a klezmer band and. Uh, you know, I always love telling people the comedy of we actually got signed at right. South by Southwest. Who though, who does that happen for? But anyway, that was the story. So we got signed by Shanaki down there. And then we did two two records with Shanaki that were interesting. I mean, the cool thing about those records is that they're from when we were a hardened road band. Uh, uh, and, of course, for people that are interested in other things, like, I mean, that was when Stan Moore was for the, for, was our regular drummer. Yeah, because Willie was on the road with the brothers, so that means something to people because people at Galactic came pretty big, and then uh, and then you know Kevin O'Day. We had we had a very interesting lineup there that was pretty steady uh, for a while uh, in that period, and so that's that's what's interesting about those records. Then we were not suddenly not on the road as much. The record business fell apart. We did another record called Borvis, I think. Um, you know that was uh, two thousand three is what I have. Yeah, two thousand three. There you go. And then we really haven't done a record since Borvis. We did a thing called the Myers that was really a little bit different, a little bit removed uh, with Willie Green. But it's interesting one because I think that's actually Willie Green's last recording. It might be his last recording. Okay. Um, and uh, but um, that didn't really go over. We didn't really have a way to get that over, and it wasn't exactly an Orleans because we're all stars record. Although I did write a lot of so all of that music is really written to be sort of a kind of uh, theme, a kind of concept record about you know, like I said, it's about. The my the Myers the, the, right. the joke is that the Myers made which is like the meters and we did it I did a right. whole sort of concept with that um, uh, so if anything is really just a an actual pastiche or or or, or, or a patchwork sort of uh, item that that would be the record where that's sort of like definitely the concept um, right and so and so this record is totally different oh. This is what we call dead air. <laughs> it's what we call dead air, huh? You got yourself muted. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. How about now? You can hear me yeah, again? Perfect. Sorry, perfect. sorry about that. My, no, my, uh, my earbuds <laughs> ran out of juice. The um, beautiful so, thing about being live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, at least we made a switch quickly. So the so uh, so the new record though is a totally different thing, and and. Uh, I think because of the nature of the band that's been together, I mean, the rhythm section who are, you know, the two guys from the Iguanas, Joe and Doug, uh, I don't know if anyone knows the Iguanas, but they're a great band from here. That's we been, spoke to, uh, we spoke to Renee the other week. Oh yeah. Well, Renee, there you go. And so, you know, we've known these, we've all known each other for a very long time. Joe and I have done more work together. I think, I think I've worked with him more than anybody I've, I've worked with. Cause maybe James Singleton, but Joe, so Joe started playing bass with the band after Nobu Ozaki was in it. Nobu is a great bass player, plays with uh, John Boutte mostly, now, or, but you know, great bass player. And then, and uh, but he was with us for years. And then, uh, then that switched, and we were switching over to Joe and Doug. That's over ten years ago. So we were working with the same rhythm section for a long time now. And then, and then the horn section just expanded. Got really exciting because it's got. Dan Ostriker and Aurora and Eland are both incredible players. And Ben Elman is there when he's there on this record. We have Nick Elman, Ben's cousin, who is a really astonishing uh, horn player and clarinet player. So we got clarinet back in the mix, which we didn't for, for a few records there and um, or a few recordings. And um, I suppose what's really different on this is that uh, we went back to uh, I definitely did not want to do one of these, you know, what the way everything works now with uh 
DAWs and and Pro Tools and all that, which is everyone just you know building stuff in the studio and overdubbing. And I I was like, you know, let's not do that. My my good friend, our good friend Mark Bingham, who recorded the first record, uh, uh, he he of course is really from the old days of recording. So you know he you know he really i was like just can we just we'll get a good sounding room and you might get to death and we'll do an old record where things like mistakes are not don't sound bad you know the way that it all frowned upon yeah the way they're frowned upon yeah the way that it was for 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 the for the previous you know 70 years so i was like well you know was that traditionalist i don't really know but i was like (laughs) but the miking wasn't it was recorded in pro tools but strange enough we didn't do any overdubs we didn't do any we did no repair no fixes just we just boom straight in and that that and uh so what you're hearing is that and i said you know let's rehearse write all this music and uh let's rehearse it up until we can really really play it until something something we really play and uh and we did that and uh, i think the, the, these songs express even more i mean th- there's a lot in them that has a lot going on i mean i of course you know compositionally i got a lot stronger in life and if you know from mm-hmm. that that gets stronger over the years so uh, the amount of uh, and i like a lot of layers and a lot of uh mm-hmm. i like a lot of convolutions so they're very they but they're executed right and and mm-hmm. exciting tunes and with exciting players so i think it came out good you know do, do you find that you revisit stuff that you revisit stuff that you look back over the body of your work um actually i don't look back that much i mean i think i i think there are references i i, I mean i i think i think what you're talking about there is do i vampirize do i vampire vampirize my uh my own stuff and uh, the, or, or general, do you find that when you're writing stuff that you come back to moods or places that you've visited before no i don't i really feel like it's my job actually to work out by contemplation or meditation or whatever where i am at now and where okay. things are at now and really try to write into what is going on now that i want actually i have listened to a lot of that stuff and i and i think to myself wow that's really good work for what were the forces then you know uh right. you know and i think that that's important you know i don't i don't think i, I think you know there's there i think there's mis misaligned uh you know uh uh garbage noise left over from the romantic era that makes people think that music has to be you know, you have to make this universal thing that isn't tied to time period. You know, it's like there's a whole lot of people who are right. afraid to write write political music because it, that'll be too tied to a time period. And right. yeah, you know, I've always thought this is this is nonsense. It doesn't matter because at a certain point you draw back the picture enough. I mean, you, you try to tell my students that I teach harmony too at at uh, mm-hmm. at uh, Tulane, and they, you know, if you say to them, you know, I mean. It, the image of a lot of composers that you would consider totally normal are not to them. I mean, it's not like they sure. sit around. They have, they really have very little relationship to Beethoven, even and you're like, but they're composition students. So, so the que- so what what I'm saying is, if you think that Beethoven wrote universal music, you'd be entirely wrong. So no no one really does. So <laughs> you can't uh, yeah. really. So no, that's so, true. Uh, so I don't know if I've overextended this interview. You tell me. No, no, not at all, not at all. I I had a few more questions. If you were okay, sure, I'm fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, what goes into the choices for the covers or the traditionals that you pull out for your albums? Uh oh, yeah. Well, I think um, in the case of this one, this one was interesting. Glenn, in the process of the last couple of years, uh, became a, an ordained rabbi. Oh, nice. and. I, and and so he's now Rabbi Glenn Hartman as of not very long ago, December, really. And this is really four months. And so and and but the interesting thing about that is that he, you know, in his studies and working all that out, I think he came across a whole bunch of other types of songs, uh, particularly, I think, from uh, from um, Hasidic, a couple of Hasidic melodies that he wanted to try out with the band and you know i was like great we'll do some other kinds of stuff so so there's that one traditional in there reb uh nigun that's in there that's uh and and so that's where that one comes from uh you know close to him and then um the other uh is there another traditional one here i'm not really sure i I thought there were two but (laughs) there we go I think there. I think there. I think it's just the just the one, um, okay. but but uh, the uh, but 
we did a lot more older of the older songs originally. I think that has to do much with learning learning the style and stuff, and and also, you know, geeking, at the beginning, you know, you're really a fan of the of those tunes and those records. You want to play them, you know. I think that's that's that starts out with a lot of bands that way, and then you work them up in whatever style, so that becomes a kind of representative thing. But I think really what happens after that, you know, especially with the writing, there's ways to take all of that material and and sort of spin it into something that is really exciting from our band, you know, for, for us mm -hmm. playing, I think. It, so, and I think then if I'm selecting traditional songs or if we're selecting traditional songs like we did for the Myers record, there's a couple for the other records there. Uh, well, we have Fresh Out the Past has no, no traditional tunes on it. So uh, I think that when I'm selecting those, we're looking for something that we can do something exciting with. You know, it's like, what is a vehicle for being able to do something exciting? You know, a lot of those songs have been played to death. There's plenty, if people are really are interested in people that have the what traditional aesthetics that play the same 30 songs, there's a lot of those bands and a hell of a right. lot of them. Um, so that's that's also another thing. Is and and that's that's fine. That's what they like doing. And and so those those songs that everybody plays, uh, I have no problem with it. I just think that for, for for our purposes, they should have something in them that we can do something with. I mean, it's an art form, and I like to be expressive with. Right. It, it has something that we can be expressive with from the from the kind of language that we speak together. You know. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Now, how, what goes into your set list? Yes, that definitely, definitely. Um, I, I think that my thing skipped there for a second. Um, what oh, okay. uh, what goes into your set list choices? What goes into your set list choices with so many albums, so many songs? You know, I, I always I, I always give away too much, but uh, you know, I, I I think it's true for all all bands. You know, is is what what songs are in current rotation? I mean, I've you know, I've I've uh, there's. And then there's periods where you're like, okay, let's get everything going again, you know, from the old days and whatever's new. And then, and then what happens is that there's sort of um, a time factor with what you can keep together and what you're playing well. In our case, it's like, well, we want to get, and now we're doing all this new material and it's very important to get that out there. Um, however, we're on some gigs where, uh, preparation time is a factor or we need or we need more material and then and then we do gravitate to a certain there's a certain repertoire that we were doing when we had less fixed number of band members okay. we really lighted on a repertoire that we could communicate easily to people and do well so that became a thing like you know what can we play well that isn't going to hang up people in my case i want things that aren't on a live show the most important thing is to get across to people it's more important mm -hmm. to me than more important to me than than the presentation of our ideas or some abstract thing or the ideas of pleasure music or something like the more important thing is how you're going to get across to people in which case you want you need a situation where the energy that can be portrayed by the musicians isn't blocked by some kind of literature that you're playing so in other words right. like i'm looking for stuff that isn't going to block the energy of the musicians and so so, uh, you know, that's different because the energy of the musicians, energy of musicians can be channeled and made more intense if you have preparation time by stuff that they're not less familiar with. But if you don't have the preparation time, you want you want kind of vehicles that mean that they can maximize what they have available in their instrument for people right. energetically. You know, you don't want block energy in music. That right. Way. That's why every blues band knows Mustang Sally, because anybody could jump up on stage and yeah. do it. Right. <laughs> right. And, and so in those cases, we get sick of it. I mean, one of the things about the Klezmer stuff, the more the more that a form is improvisational, the more that you can actually get away with that, which is why, you know, it, it, it didn't, you know, it's you can tell from the extant amount of John Coltrane records that are put out, if you can improvise that much, it doesn't matter if you play Naima every day for three years, you know, it just <laughs> doesn't matter because this it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it. it's an opening place where the, a massive amount of bloodletting can go on once the tune has started in any direction with those guys, because they can improvise much. So the more fixed form is the more likely you are to get sick of it. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're, it, it, but you know, Klezmer, the, the way we play, it's pretty improvisational. And so, uh, so it doesn't really matter. They're more just a way to start the conversation. There you go. So, so let me ask you about electric eggplant. Cause that seems more, that seems conversational. What sure, I, I found about it. What, yeah. what was that? And, uh, who was in it? 
Yeah, Electric Eggplant. That's an interesting record, actually, because that was um, w w what happened with that is that I had had a band uh, since the early '90s that I started to play my material that was called uh, that is called Naked on the Floor. Naked on the Floor was uh, myself, the absolutely legendary and stellar Tim Green on saxophone, who really uh, is one of my music mentors, or at least he really pushed me to do my own thing along with a few other very key New Orleans musicians. But he was instrumental. So, you know, you have to start your own band and do your own thing. This is because in those days I was playing in Michael Ray and the Cosmic Crew. And I had a little gig going with Walter Payton that I did and and uh, some some people that were really helping out. But they were like, you really should do your own thing. So and Tim was like, well, I'll play with you. And James Singleton, you know, for a, a major New Orleans bassist uh, figure in, in New Orleans, uh, rhythm and blues and jazz music all over. Uh, he was like, oh, I'll play in your band. And so I had this band with uh, Tim Green and him and actually for a while, Charlie Miller from Dr. John's band and, uh, you know, playing my tunes. Uh, we went through mm -hmm. a few drummers that, that were really incredible back then. And so that was my regular band. My good friend Stanton, actually, I, when I started Naked on the Floor, it was really a trio. It was me and Stanton and, and Arthur Kassler, the original bass player of the Klezmer band. It was a trio, uh, which is how the name of the band came about. But but we were, uh, you know, Stanton, of course, was doing doing better, and he had some connections with record contract stuff. And so basically what happened is right after, this was after Katrina, I think all of us were just existentially freaked out by what had happened and what are we doing in life. And stanton had made inroads with some other kinds of markets and stuff and was like well look you know if you do your tunes with my people who were friends of mine i mean i knew his people what he meant by his people they're, they're you know they're great people but he's like why don't you do this with my with my people and i was like wow that that'd be an amazing opportunity work for me right <laughs> works for me and uh, Stanton is very generous, and you know he helped foot the bill on that one. And they, they were all very generous, actually. Skerrick and Mike Dillon. I mean, these are all very good friends of mine now. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, you know, some some of the best players that I that I get to play with regular. I'm I'm stunned that I do. But um, Tim died. Also, Tim Green died a few a few years mm -hmm. back. So uh, the important thing that record stance is even more important. Uh, and and Todd Sikafus was on the record. Mm -hmm. And Todd is a great bass player who runs his own thing. We were a little bit uh, closer around at that point. But we, it was Todd Sikafus and Mike Dillon and Skerrick and Stanton and of course the incredible wizard of a recording engineer here, Mike Napolitano. And uh, Mike is so incredible that, you know, I mean, he knew it wasn't like he was recording a big rock record, but we we're going to get a bigger sound. He's like, what are your favorite? You know, it was like getting a haircut. He's like, get, get, send, me your, send me your three favorite records. You know, with Mike, that means you send him your three favorite records and you get in the studio and he's already worked out everything that Warrior. does that. It's, it, it, it does that. You know, you're just there. You Then you just have to play, you know, and he and uh, so. uh and we did that record, but you know, as Stanton and uh, and Mike Dillon put it, uh, you know, November two thousand and six was when the music business really just suddenly fell apart, which happens to be mm -hmm. when we recorded the records. So, so it actually just sort of disappeared. People were beginning download services, uh, mm -hmm. so he, he got me hooked up with that. But there was no real way to get it across. So now it just sits there like that. I mean, I love mm -hmm. the record. I, I think everyone hearing the record loves the record because those guys really mm -hmm. delivered. And Stanton, we need to get a reissued. I'd love to actually. I'd love to, and it's really funny actually because it's called Electric Eggplant and has that that funny emoji thing on it that everyone, right. uh, you know, the the phallic yeah. emoji. But right. the funny thing is, in two thousand six, it wasn't really like the thing that everybody right. did that way. So so I have to change the cover. But I don't right. mind calling you Electric Eggplant. It's just kind of a date. The, the cover is dated. You got to get a got to got to get a different emoji scenario up there or something. Right. You know? So so. Uh, but but anyway, I, the music is great, and I'd love to re-release it. It's all available on my website, though. You know that 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 particular record, and and mm -hmm. uh, it's, I think maybe a couple of other places. But you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I'm I'm, so, I'm such a mess. I haven't. I should have my life on Bandcamp like every other you know. Uh, yeah. Guy. Right. But I, <laughs> I, I, it, I, I mess up with. I'm sort of half on the internet and half not. So you know. So. I, I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks back, and I mentioned Bandcamp. They never heard of it, and I was like, Bandcamp might not be what it used to be, but it's still better than anything else out there. At least you oh, might yeah. get a buck or two from somebody, you know. 
Yeah. Well, money and music is a, you know, I mean, I, you know, right. don't, we can go to all philosophy thing with that. Right, I don't, yeah. I don't, I really don't worry about it, which is actually probably why I'm not there. I mean, I think it's great for people to be able to get access to things, but I'm mm. certainly not, I would really be an unhappy person in life if I thought, especially someone in my generation is getting really the shaft. I'm supposed to be making a lot of money. I should be like the right. Eagles, you know, like the, the, that world right. sailed. It's gone. It, 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 it's, it's come full circle to from pre-records where you make your money playing live. Uh, yeah, you I know? prefer it. I mean, I, I, you know, I think, listen, like I said, if you were listening, if you're going to deal with my actual beliefs, I think the recording is just totally overblown. I think we had, okay. we've had it. We have it at least at bare minimum. It's clearly longer than that, but even by rec, but even by, just the record in, in the in yeah. historical record, we can see 10,000 years of music. And right. only a hundred years of it has uh, this recording thing, and everybody talks about it as though, oh no, music's over, no one cares about music, blah blah blah. And you're like, you're like, what do you mean? You mean they don't care? You mean records aren't that exciting anymore? That's what you're right. talking about. Music, music is enough. Is it? It's the, it, you know, because it's even a record is something that's supposed to remind people of an incredible musical experience right. that they, a real musical experience they had, where they had, their brain had to deal with. The people I call it the, people. It was, go ahead. I call it the artifact. I call yeah, studio stuff the artifact. It's the artifact. You know, it, it reminds people of something. And I mean, certainly there's great, I'm not denying all the great pieces of, you know, it, it's not like uh, I'm not saying that, you know, because, you know, uh, it, it, you put on Axis Boulders Love. How many people's first sex experience happened with that record? I mean, you know, it's, you, know you can't deny these, 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 these records are huge, you know, huge cultural sure. features. Pink Floyd records or whatever, you know, but they're not, you know, but, and, and they're incredible, uh, you know, sort of an, an idea coming to fruition. That's a brilliant right. example of a recorded record, but no, no, they don't, they don't happen anymore. And they hardly happened then. I mean, they, you know, we can say, this is the, this is, this is the, the, this is the paragon of where recording got to. And then, you know, now it's just like, you know, but playing live, it's really where it's at. Where can, where can people get your artifact? My it's artifact is available. <laughs> well, the Klezmer artifact is going to be way more widely available than most of the records that we've had. So you'll be able to get that on all the download services. Our okay. records will be available. We're actually doing vinyl this time, which makes me feel like... Which, uh, what's the label? What label are you working with? That's a good question. I can't remember. Glenn told me that there's some interest from somebody. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm actually not clear on that. That This tells you where I sit in the band. I write all, I write a lot of music and I do a lot of musical stuff. And I let a lot of the phone calls go. Although Glenn and I consult a lot of things. But I think I, think I tend to be a very, uh, I'm very poor on details and very big, very good on very large range long pic big picture things so i've right. missed here uh, I mean, now obviously i'm not saying that whoever's putting out your record is a part of the big picture thing but somehow i've omitted the detail there in getting the record out and all that but the record will be available on all of our websites all the social media all that stuff uh, that's related to us you'll be able to get there and and it's coming out soon i mean i know that the the, yeah. the cd is the CDs are in, and the vinyl records will have a record release in a, in a few weeks after from now. Right. We'll, we'll have all the links down in the show description down there. And one other thing I want to ask you about before we get out of here, you have a podcast or a couple podcasts, maybe. Yeah. What are they called, and what is that all about? Okay. The first podcast was called uh, uh, was um, it's called uh, Interviews with Notable New Orleans Musicians, and um, Initially, I did that because I was very disappointed with the music press that, that would go on. I thought it was actually terrible, and I thought it was doing a total disservice to uh, musicians and music music scene in general that they they missed almost everything because of not knowing how to ask questions of, of people. As though, so it made musicians look like they didn't have ideas, which meant why should anybody listen to them? I mean, I don't, you know, all, if every, if every article about musicians has the same form and looks the same and the musicians all come out looking the same. So I thought that was a terrible idea. So I started doing my own interviews really as a way to, as a kind of, you know, uh, send up of, of bad music journalists. And I, and, uh, but they come out more because they're really conversations with the people and they're not formatted. So it really ends up coming out like more like oral histories as you'd see in an archive. But mm -hmm. so there's that podcast that I, that was the early one that started around 2010. And I, and, uh, that one has great music, great stuff from great ends of the New Orleans music scene, really important thinkers that you wouldn't 
um, that you maybe wouldn't have heard from that all have real important ideas and some of them you have heard from and are, are more prominent and uh, certainly some in there that those are the only uh, interviews that are around right. of some of those musicians that died. So that one's, that's very cool. That's the interviews of notable New Orleans musicians. Later on, more recently in the, uh, after, the, during the pandemic or just before the pandemic, I was doing a film podcast with uh, my friend, Henry Griffin, um, where we were doing conversations on films. We'd pick a couple movies and discuss them. Uh, and, uh, and we had a series of stuff going on like that before Henry had a kid in his life and and um uh henry's you know makes uh makes movies uh himself and they actually he made a funny movie about the klezmer all-stars except it's not it's sort of about everyone is a derivation from somebody about klezmer's called, called mutiny so he's a good filmmaker and i've i've comp I've, I've dealt with the composition of that so we have a film podcast and uh that uh that one this the later iteration of that came to be called the double MacGuffin that's available up there. And I put on under the double MacGuffin, I put all the rest of the older ones that were just our regular film podcast in under there. Then my friend, Dave Bandrowski, who has a, a thing called banjo studio. He sells, you know, he's a, he's a rep for um, Deering banjo and, and, uh, and Collins guitars and, and which, you know, boy, do we love Collins guitars. Uh, he, uh, he, um, uh, he asked me to do a podcast to, to, for his website, and that was a lot higher prof prof profile. People came through because that's some of my some of my favorite interviews I did. I got to interview Taj Mahal and people like that that are oh, really nice. yeah. There's so so, and that's under if you look under I I list all those Banjo Studio podcasts. There's everything from you know my old associates from uh, from uh, Counting Crows or the different people that are on there. Also some of the great. Uh, people out of the bluegrass side, experimental, Danny Barnes, are really they really uh, uh, very uh, uh, innovative and also very old school uh, mm -hmm. uh, bluegrass banjo. A lot of banjo players, but some guitarists, some big songwriters, uh, you know, Joe Henry, things like that are on there. So that's that's another one. There was a period where uh, uh, Universal was asking me to do things. So there's this other podcast floating around, but it, it's not. There's only a couple things on there. It's not really. It wasn't really my jam. I I, I, right. I, I want to do. I, I'm interested in interviewing people that I'm interested in. You know, that, same. You know. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're simpatico on that. Yeah, there. yeah. It oh. sounds like it. You know. So those podcasts are fun. I, I I I anybody who's really into and you'll discover a lot about a lot of kinds of New Orleans music that really didn't get covered. I mean, there's a way in which everything. In you know, as, as my friend. I, I, Salgado, who had started Cafe Brazil, you know, when, when that was, the, when that was the, the, the biggest, the, you know, the important club down here for years. And, you know, as he put it, everything in New Orleans is underground. So if you're into underground shit, you know, you can really get a lot of it, it, it out, out of, out of there and stuff that you wouldn't have seen from the underground and maybe connections into mm -hmm. kinds of music here that are available, but we're sort of from the, from the dark end of the nineties. <laughs> I, 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 I so want to interview Ed Volker, but I feel like I'd have to actually fly to new Orleans and take him out to a bar somewhere and actually get an interview from him. I'd never get him with something like this. Yeah. It, it, it's goes to take, yeah, the tech. I don't know. Ed is, Ed is great. And Ed, I love really, that. he has, yeah, he can boy. Yeah. And he can hold forth on some subjects. So, you know, yeah, but yeah, it's a good. It would be great. You know, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it'd be you have great. to get him in a room, though. I think you'd have to get him in a room with a camera in order to do it that way. You know. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, you know, but you know, yeah, Ed's definitely, definitely a great character for for interviewing, and uh, yeah. I, I never got there, but. Uh, yeah. It's That's interesting. True. You were interviewing Renee. Renee has a great podcast called Trouble yes. Podcast here. That I, yeah. in fact, I he came to me to figure out how to. Initially, when they started that, you know, I had to help them get mm -hmm. started on how to put a podcast up, and so I love the podcast thing. I think it's great. Yeah. You know, although I definitely have not, I I definitely didn't push for, you know, every. I liked it in the early days when you didn't have to format everything, and it was just sort of wild, you know, put up these recordings, and right? Like that. So, so, but, uh, but I, you know, it's cool, you know, whatever the development. I guess I, people ask me about whether I'm going to continue it and i think i am but i think i have to work out i think i have to work out really what the reasons that i'm doing it but i mm. i think uh, you know i know there's some rumblings about maybe re 
right doing a little bit of writing for the offbeat so uh if i do that then i think that the two things might sort of feed each other dovetail right yeah. So, and then I'll have an angle that, that, you know, that'll, that'll deal with both of them. That's again, cool. I like that. I like the sound of that. I like that. Yeah. So where, where am I going to catch you live if I'm somewhere in this country right now? Okay. Well, there's two things. There's me and there's the New Orleans Clubs and World Stars. If you're me, you're going to catch me, especially coming up all over uh, New Orleans. I got like, I don't know, I have 20 gigs in 10 days coming up at one of those periods. Uh, jazz, jazz Fest. Um, French jazz Quarter Fest. Fest. We have French right. Quarter Fest. I'm going on the road with Glenn Hartman for uh, Steve Riley has uh, Steve Riley mm. the great the great Steve Riley has a the man uh, who play, Playboys yeah and he has a thing that goes out called Accordion Kings which is a review of it's basically got uh, an accordion player and a and a, an accompanist in in several different styles we did it once before but it's right before the pandemic. Um, and it, uh, so, you know, there's incredible people on there. I mean, Glenn's doing the Klezmer side, but then there's like Alex Baca, who's like this. I mean, you, you can't imagine the level of, you know, the, the, from the text meeting. It'd be incredible. And uh, oh, Alex Miser, it, these incredible accordion players. So we're going out to, uh, I think we have, I can't remember exactly. I think maybe it's a date in Texas, date in Lake Charles, and a date in Lafayette, date in New Orleans, or if it's only, or maybe it's only three of those. Maybe right. Texas isn't in there. Maybe they're going to Texas, but we're not on that show anyway. Um, so I'll be going on the road with that April 9th, April 18th. And then, uh, and then other than that, uh, you know, just, uh, just, it'll be just stuff around new Orleans, but it's with, mm -hmm. I got a record coming out with a band called 007. Great band with that's with Jeffrey Clemens from G love and the special sauce guy from the iguanas. Oh. Great, great song great songwriter alex mcmurray so it's just the four of us we do rock steady oh, nice. and then uh, uh there's another rock steady band i play with which is papa molly's rock steady band called Trinity okay. Down Underground. um klezmer also has i got several gigs with james singleton and scarrett coming up because we're we're hitting jazz fest mm -hmm. uh uh my group naked on the floor we're doing a night uh i play with helen jelay coming up helen jelay is a great oh, cellist, fellow but, player fantastic yeah. Yeah, so I got some stuff coming up with Helen. And um, uh, what else do I play with? I play with the Naked Orchestra. That's my big band. It plays with my compositions. But my 18 to 24 piece big band. That's uh, that's. You need a I, dance card or a spreadsheet there. I, I do. And actually, this jazz is the, the orchestra section is not actually playing this jazz fest. But I do okay. I do tend to put out right, right before the, the festival starts, right before I start the, the run, I usually do suddenly fire up onto the onto the end i mean yeah i wish i had it together as good as like my you know uh, you know my good friend brian haas is so good right. at getting his, getting his schedule his list of gigs up there it always amazes me i'm like damn why didn't i do that but you know anyway i've I, i've learned the lesson i do try to get a little bit of the information out because people usually torture me with how come you, you never tell anybody where you're playing and i say i don't know yeah. it's the internet look it up <laughs> yeah you know, when, you, when you mentioned uh beethoven earlier i thought of brian and the electric beethoven that he does oh which yeah is, uh, fantastic we interviewed him once and he was talking about some guy had come to see a couple shows and was talking about how much he loved the music and brian said something to him about it being beethoven and the guy was like what are you talking about didn't even realize that it was Beethoven's music that he had come to see three nights in a row. Yeah, well, Brian is one of the most extraordinary musicians uh, that I've that I've uh, that I've had around me in my life, and and uh, and um, and he, you know, I always laugh with him because I saw him when he was really young. My girlfriend at the time used to be the manager of a club here, and uh, I had played a show until three a.m. with Skerrick and Mike Dillon. And then in that club, and then it was jazz, and then it, it cleared out. And I and I finally left the club, and it was daylight outside, and there was a massive line of hippies up the block. And I'm like, "What is? What the hell is going on?" And my girlfriend's like, "Well, I booked this guy. He's coming in here with this band." Blah, blah, blah. So Jacob Fred Odyssey comes in, and the first thing is this guy is playing a kid. He's like in a tie dye, and he's playing like Cecil Taylor. And I said, and I was. <laughs> And I'm trying to work out who I can call at that time of the morning and be like, there's some fucking kid playing like Cecil Taylor and everyone wants to see this. 
what the hell is going on? And I always laugh with him because I, you know, that 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 experience was so weird. And then a number of years later, you know, so I, I paid attention, but a number of years later, it's sort of, you know, we ended up, I I think through Skerrick, basically, we ended up uh, doing some stuff. But Brian is definitely one of the most extraordinary uh, musicians that uh, that I've ever come across. I think that's that's in in tandem for everybody. But the amount of moves that he's able to run on people with like that that make it so that people aren't able you know the i mean we rate we relate a lot in terms of a kind of uh i don't know what you call it a way of uh of developing or uh, but really hiding so uh you know uh making very implicit some some weird kinds of harmony that make it mm. so that people can't really tell that what what the the direct thing is that you're messing with. I don't know if you are, but he's he's kind of he's a master of that. So. He he does ha uh, he does something just him and Helen do a duo thing. Yep. yep. Yeah. Well, and, and like they, luckily I get to play he did, go ahead. Improvise everything. Yeah, just and they just walk in and improvise. Yeah, we get to do that too. Right. You know, I mean James it's James Sheldon's right. gig, you know, yeah, and, and, and not for sound. Yeah, James. What's you know. So yeah, uh, I was going to say James. What? Well, um, when I was uh, when uh, when we were at, talking to Brian, he was at James's house because he had better internet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. yeah. There's a lot where he hangs around when he's in town, but yeah, you know, so we mm -hmm. get to work together with James, and 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 I do love that. I mean, it's just really fun, and you know, for a while it was with with Skerek too. Although you know, I mean, I we did the mm -hmm. sauce fest down here and these things, which he's not around for. I mean, Brian's a busy guy, you know, he's always up to something, mm -hmm. you know, which for good reason. Um, yeah. But I, now, I, that I punkadelic it. thing with Mike now is pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing, you know. So I cherish any opportunity I have to play with those guys, you know, when they're around. That's one of that's one of the worlds I get to, one of the worlds I get to play when I pick, call them a world. They're sort of well, it's, it's a fun world. Play. It's a fun world. I like it. Yeah, over there. So I like that. So it's a crossover <laughs> with that. You know, I get get to do some of that and some of I get to I'm very lucky. I get to do a lot of Yes, that. you are. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. Jonathan, thank you so much. Um, we're hitting up on the hour. Uh Perhaps we will talk again soon. This was fantastic. I'd love to. I thank you for having me. So much left on the table there, Ed. But uh, we'll see everybody.